Welcome to the Rusted Garden. Today is May 28th and this is the second video on growing large beefsteak tomatoes or large tomatoes and it's also the beefsteak challenge. Today we're going to talk about staking, uh, mulching, light pruning and wh what do you do with your tomato plants when they're about this size to get them ready you know for full growth in the summer. It's also the challenge that I put out to Callie Kim back in April to see who could grow the largest red beefsteak come August 1st. Now I know she's got her plant up and going and it's doing really well. I planted mine back I think it was on April 18th so it's been like six weeks and they finally have come through and I need to really pick out which one I'm going to keep. And before I get to that I just want to show you the other plants. These plants were started as transplants indoors and a lot of people ask me well do I need to start them as transplants? You don't have to. If you have a long growing season you can go ahead and drop the seeds right into the ground. And the first video shows you how I did it with these plants. But you can see the difference in size. One of the plants back there is flowering. So you can gain about six weeks worth of growth. Now once these plants back here get to the size they slow down a little bit start flowering they'll keep growing but you're going to see the plant that I keep here is going to catch up to them pretty quick so we're going to take a look and remove the smallest now this one's had some weird curling and distortion on the leaves so I'm going to remove this one and we're going to keep that one for the challenge Kim's on the west coast, I'm on the east coast. So April was a little bit different here. It was cold. These seeds are protected with this cloche, but things are pretty much the same now weather-wise. We got the warm weather, we got the sunshine. This guy's good to catch up. Now she's prepared her area a little bit differently. I think she's thrown in a couple of fish into her planting hole, maybe a frying pan. She's also erected a really large trellis cage made out of, I don't know, some sort of reinforced concrete wire but she's expecting a big plant and I just want to say sorry Kim this little guy from seed growing up this cage here is going to beat you come August 1st although you're doing a great job so let's talk about the mulching mulching is really done to create a disease splash barrier so sometimes you may have soil borne diseases in your area by putting down the mulch you keep the soil from splashing up on the undersides of your leaves and you can see we had crazy rain we actually got 10 inches yesterday there's lots of flooding going on around here but you can even see with the mulching some soil splashed up on there that's not really a problem if you don't have the soil borne diseases but mulching helps retain water it helps create a disease splash barrier. Some people don't like to use the shredded hardwood. It may they support like diseases and fungus by letting it kind of grow on the shredded part, on the wood part. I've not really had that problem, but I do recommend it to contain moisture in your ground and also to create that splash barrier. And if you don't want to use shredded hardwood, certainly you can use dirt. If there's not a problem in your area, don't worry about it. Or you can use the weed block, the fabric with the holes in it, and just cover it across. That's never going to hold disease or fungus on there. But I do recommend that. We're going to, in the future video, talk about pruning, but we're not going to take the suckers out right now. We're just going to remove some of the leaves from the bottom. We'll get to feeding, top dressing, watering, staking, and all that. Now the whole key to pruning your tomatoes is not to overdo it and there is no exact way to prune. In some cases you don't even have to. If you don't have disease or pest problems you can let your tomatoes just grow as nature intended them to grow. The reason you prune is to manage diseases, to manage pests, to manage size. But in my area, Maryland Zone 7, we have humid summers Early blight always rolls in, so I like to prune lightly. And here we're just going to cut off. I would cut them, keep it nice sharp cut, and remove the bottom leaves. That's going to allow air to start circulating through here and just keep the air moving around your plant. So the leaves dry more quickly and it causes less problems if you have fungus issues, disease issues. And you can see the tomato looks great. Two light clips will prune more over time. Now the bottom leaves often have a beat up look to them. You can see the yellowing there. That's not a disease. That's not anything to worry about. You can see little marks right above my thumb. That could be some insect sucking on there. Nothing to worry about. When your leaves on the bottom get weaker, they get attacked by insects. As you move up higher, the stronger leaves are able to defend themselves and are doing perfectly fine. Same thing, come over here. Now this is really purple. 
it's because it's a midnight snack variety, high in anthocyanin, so it's good to have that purple color to it. You can see a pest attack right there, only on one leaf, nothing to worry about. We're going to get down to the bottom with the scissors and just cut out the bottom leaves. And we're going to let that grow. That's a sucker. Suckers are not a bad word. They will grow into full production stems that will flower and produce fruit. You can keep them, but we'll talk more about that in the third video. Right now I'm just taking the bottom leaves out and giving the tomato a chance to really maximize pulling in the sun with as many leaves as possible, but respecting the need to get that air circulating under there. Now, with this humid weather, with this rain, you may have transplants that start doing something like this. They get all these bumps along the stem. That's perfectly normal because of the rain, because of the water. Those are roots, the root nodes. So these tomatoes believe that they're touching the ground, that they've got water around them, and they're trying to root out. That's nothing to worry about. It looks really, really crazy. So I'm going to get to trimming the bottom leaves for all these plants, and then we'll talk about staking. So this is all I took off the plants with this pruning. Just some of the leaves from the bottom, some of the suckers, which I'm going to actually show you what they are, because there's a lot of misinformation about them. They do not hurt your plant. Again, you just remove them to control size. So don't take off a lot of the leaves. If you take off too many, it can actually shock the plant a little bit. You don't want that to happen. So here is a tomato. Starts at the ground. That's the main stem, main stem, main stem. Leaf comes out right in the joint. That's what is known as a sucker. That's gonna create its own production stem, which means it will grow, leaf, flower, suckers will come out of that. Same thing. This is the main stem. We'll talk more about pruning in future videos. As you get to here, a leaf comes out. The stem continues. This is a sucker. You could actually remove that now if you're controlling this for size for a specific reason. And then as the main stem goes, you get a flower cluster. It continues up. Leaf comes out. A small, tiny Suckers coming right out of there. One will grow out of there. Continue up. More leaves. More leaves. Main stem. That's a sucker right in there in front of my finger. And then more flowers. The production stem is basically a stem, leaves, leaves, flower, leaves, leaves, flower. It depends on the variety. And that would be just one main stem right through here. When you let the suckers grow into the joint, they will create their own production stem. This will have flowers on here and it will fruit. And again, it just depends on what you want to do if you decide to remove some of the suckers or to keep some of the suckers. All up to you in your area. So that's the general pruning. Now, for caging or staking, you can use different cages. These are all indeterminate variety tomatoes. A couple of beef steaks in there. Something solid, you want it to be at least five feet tall because these plants will all get well over five feet. Drop them in now while the plants are smaller. This is not gonna damage the roots. You wanna make sure that you have a nice gap between wherever the prongs go in and the stem. It will cut some roots, but it's not gonna matter. Never drop a post, for instance, like this one, right alongside of the tomato because you're gonna shear off a lot of roots. Put it at about two or three inches and those are six to eight foot stakes. That's where the tomato is going to grow. Right now we're just getting the stakes in why the plants are smaller and the root systems are smaller. And you can use all kinds of different things for your stakes, for your cages, for your cages for trellising. This is your standard four hoop wire cage. We're gonna just take it over here real quick. And this Candyland Red doesn't have a cage on and you would just drop it over, doing this left-handed, and just press it in. This is a nice thick wire cage. If you get something that's uh, thinner, some of these bigger beef stakes will knock that down. So you would just insert a stake right down through here for support. So that's generally how I stake my tomatoes. You wanna get them 
in place now when the tomatoes are about this size. We need to move this guy. This is the one that's get a beat. Callie Kim. We'll just set that up just like that. Press it in. All right, so let's get to top dressing and a water soluble feeding. So top dressing is really about putting fertilizer on top of the surface and allowing that to break down, get to your plant roots. Now, you might not know, tomato plants actually have deep roots right at the bottom of the plant and they go deep into the ground and then they also send out surface roots. It's the surface roots that bring in a lot of the nutrients and the deeper roots go down. They also find nutrients, of course, but also get the water that's down there. So tomatoes will send out thousands of surface roots and the top dressing is really meant to get to that. Now, I've been using worm castings. You can use them if you want, you don't have to. If you don't wanna use worm castings, you could use a basic organic fertilizer. They're pretty much all the same. If you don't wanna use that and you have plenty of compost, you can use compost, and that's for my hot composter. It's not quite done, but that's a coffee compost. I will link the video showing you the composter that I'm using to make that, and also my video on using worm castings. But the principle is pretty much the same. So I like to combine different things. For instance, you have the organic fertilizer. This is an insoluble form of N, P, and K. Great stuff. But insoluble means that the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and nutrients aren't broken down into a form that the tomato can use right away. So when you top dress, that's about two tablespoons, throw it around and then just scratch it into the surface. You can stay about an inch away from the stem, but the organic fertilizers, the casting, the compost, isn't really going to hurt it. Scratch it in about two tablespoons. Being an insoluble fertilizer, it's going to have to be broken down by microbiology to render the N, P, and K into a form that the plant can immediately take it into its system. Or, not immediately, but slowly over time. That's why it's considered a slow-release fertilizer, because over time, the microbiology breaks down the organic fertilizer, and then it's able to be taken into the root system. Worm castings are different in that I like to call it the end product of nature, and this is already in a form that your tomato can use. Same thing, scratch it in. After the worm digests the organic matter, it's excreted in a form that can be taken in by the tomato plant. Now, it's also a slow release, not because it has to be broken down by soil biology, but because when it comes out of the worm, when it's excreted, I can't remember, it's either covered in a, wa a waxy substance, substance or an oily substance. Either way, it sort of has a shell around it and that slowly breaks down, slowly feeding your plant over time. And that's a great way to manage your tomato plants is you don't want to give them a super burst of fertilizer. They go crazy, they grow too quickly. You just want a nice, steady, slow release of the fertilizers and that's how you would top dress using worm castings or the organic fertilizer. If you have compost, let's pretend this is fully broken down. You can see the coffee in there. You would just scratch that into the surface too, quarter inch. That will slowly release to the plant. So you can use compost, you can use organic fertilizer, or you can use worm castings. Or what I like to do is I'm using a combination, two tablespoons around there, of the worm castings and your organic fertilizer. Worm castings provide good fungi, the microbiology needed to break down your organic fertilizer so it speeds up the process a little bit and that will all work together to nicely feed your tomato plants. Okay, so let's get to the water-soluble fertilizer. And in this case, sometimes I use worm casting tea. Sometimes I use fish emulsion. If you want to use miracle Grow, if you don't like that company, similar product from a different company, that's a chemical fertilizer. That won't hurt your plants. Regardless of what people say, everything's a chemical. Compost is a chemical. The organic fertilizer is a chemical. 
The worm castings are chemicals. They're just in different forms. So you could use a water-soluble, human-made chemical fertilizer for this process. You could use fish emulsion. You could use worm casting tea. They're all soluble forms of fertilizer, which means when they hit the leaf, the leaf is going to be able to absorb some nutrients and the roots are going to be able to take in that N, P, and K right away. It's soluble. It's immediately ready to the plant. So we do both. We top dress and then we water from the top. You know, and finally we'll get to the water soluble fertilizing. Watering, you want to water your garden at least once a week, if not twice a week when it gets hot. About an inch of water. A lot of people ask me watering questions. It's really hard to say how much you should water because all of our zones are different. But when you do, you want a good soaking because you want that water to get down deep into the soil towards the root system. Now some of you may have noticed the white PVC tube there. That's from a video, I will link to it. But that is a, a deep composting tube. It goes down about three feet. I drop in my organic matter. There's holes drilled in the, the PVC and worms can come in and out of there and move that organic matter around in the ground. You can also water in that and it will get deep into your garden. So finally the water soluble fertilizer. I'm using actually a combination in there of fish emulsion which is a 311 soluble fertilizer immediately available to your plants. And I'm using worm casting tea, Vermistera. If you like worm casting products I highly recommend them. I'll put a link in my description using both. Now there is benefit I believe to putting fish emulsion and worm casting tea on your leaves. I think it populates the leaf with good microbes. Just soak it in and that makes it harder for the bad fungi to get onto your leaves. How often do you do this? About every 7 to 14 days depending on what your plant needs. So we took care of that one. Let me just soak that a little bit. But I just want to show you how I do it. It's nothing fancy. Soak the leaves well, then soak the area under it for about two or three seconds, and that's all you do. The whole key to growing large tomatoes is just slow and steady feedings. Now, you can use the human made chemical fertilizers except they are usually like a 24, 12, 16 N, P, and K. That's way too high. This is the one that's going to beat Kim. And we'll give that a little bit extra since he's small. That is too high. That's just going to produce really quick leaf growth. Your plant leaves kind of get thin and flimsy, juicy, and it does attract bugs. I think when that happens, so cut your organic, I'm sorry, cut your chemical fertilizers like miracle Grow or similar by at least half, if not, you know, by two thirds. You just don't need that much N, P, and K on your vegetable plants. They really turn green, they look nice, but they aren't as healthy as you think. Less of the human-made chemical fertilizers. This is just one gallon container. And that's it. That's watered this whole area. Worm casting tea goes a long way. It's sold as a concentrate. Fish emulsion goes a long way. So all these plants are set up and ready for video three. Please check out my seed shop at www.therustedgarden.com and also check out my other YouTube videos. Thanks for watching.